Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode, another edition of the Pound Pound Boxing Report. I'm your host, Michael. Uh, again, with me is my co-host, Ken. How you doing this evening, Ken? Good, good. How you doing? Doing all right, doing all right. I know it's been a couple of weeks since we've been on the air, uh, but we are back uh, to bring you more boxing. Uh, for those who are new to the show, the Pound for Pound Boxing Report is a show slash podcast that talks all things boxing. Our motto is, when boxing is good, we will talk about it. When boxing is bad, we will talk about it. Bottom line is, if it concerns boxing, we will talk about it. Uh, there are two places where you can find out information about the Pound for Pound Boxing Report. And those two places are the Pound for Pound Boxing Report blog page. By that name, the Pound for Pound Boxing Report. The address for that is p4pboxingreport.wordpress.com. I'll repeat that, p4pboxingreport.wordpress.com. You can also go to the Pound for Pound Boxing Report podcast page. And the address for that is p4pboxingreport.podomatic.com. And repeat that, p4pboxingreport.podomatic.com. On each of those pages, you can find information on where you can find myself and Kent all over social media, Facebook, Twitter, and whatnot. Uh, you can find where you can find you can find links to whether you can find a pound, you can find links as to whether you can where you can hit up the pound for pound box report on Facebook on Google Plus on WordPress on Automatic on Twitter on Tumblr uh, Facebook again uh, Pinterest RSS feed you can also find um, a link where you can donate your account and the address for that is donateyouraccount.com forward slash p4p box report and repeat that donate your account dot com forward slash p4p box report and when you donate your account what you what happens is that any tweet that comes from the pound for pound box report twitter page your twitter account would automatically retweet any tweet that comes from the pound for pound box report twitter page so be a friend be a pal be a buddy and donate your twitter account uh, also a couple issues got the way I am for those who may not know yours truly I am officially a contributor to Ring News 24. Uh, that's a boxing-based website over in the over in Great Britain. Uh, just go to ring24.com and you can find my latest blogs there. Current my recent blog about Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. and we will have a whole lot to say about him later on the show in a couple of minutes. Uh, and uh, let me add that uh, for those who follow the Pound for Pound Box Report uh, blog page and Facebook and Google Plus page and Tumblr. I've been promoting a lot the Black Web Blog Awards as my blog, the Pound for Pound Box Report, was nominated for Best Sports Blog. Well, I just found out word today that my blog, the Pound for Pound Boxing Report, actually won uh, 2013 Black Web Blog Award for Best Sports Blog. And I want to thank everybody, starting with you, Kent, because I post a, all the shows, all the podcasts from the shows, and we get a lot of feedback from that on the blog page as well. I want to thank everybody from uh, sh sh folks like Sharif Jackson for his science blog, uh, Neil Carter, uh, the ladies of Nergasm Noir on Twitter, Monica and Bruce from Now in Session with Monica and Bruce, uh, June from Harlem, uh, our frequent friend and guest Ryan, aka No Host Bard, um, just a whole bunch of folks who went out of their way to sh show support for the Pound for Pound Box Report and who actually voted for the Black Web Blog Awards. Also, Ring News 24, they did a lot of help for me as well, promoting the Black Web Blog Awards in my, in my blog. So I want to thank everybody for showing love and supporting and voting for the Pound for Pound Box Report. As it won, I found today, uh, found out today, it actually won the award for Best Sports Blog. So I want to thank you, Kent, and everybody else. Greatly appreciate it. You're welcome. You're very welcome. And with that out the way, those housekeeping orders out the way, let's get the show started tonight and talk about what everybody's been talking about, and that is uh, fights over this past weekend, specifically what happened. It went down in Carson, California on HBO, Julio Cesar Chavez scoring a very controversial win over Brian Vera this past Saturday, unanimous decision, 94-96, 97-93. 98-92, um, what was supposed to be a middleweight bout turned into a light heavyweight bout, and we'll get into that, why that happened, but I want to go to you on Kent, to you with this, Kent. A lot, as I said before, a lot of controversy, a lot of talk, even before the fight, and even more after the fight, and after the piss poor performance, as far as I'm concerned, by Chavez Jr. Yeah, it was, that was probably his worst performance ever. I mean, there's been fights where he's he's gotten the benefit of the doubt, against uh, Matt Vanda 
and you know Billy Lyell and other other guys that he probably shouldn't have gotten a decision against, but he did. And I'll be honest with you, the first five or six rounds he looked all right. I don't think he looked great. I mean, he was you know landing the harder shots. He was landing really good counters um, off of you know he was really taking advantage of Vera's aggressiveness which I, I think won him some early rounds, actually, and, 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 and it helped him sweep the rest of the fight, was the activity. Vera was a lot busier. Um, Chavez was definitely landing the eye-catching blows. Those, those, were, were, those, I think, that's why, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of people were upset at the decision, you know, and, and me too, but I figured the scoring, a lot of the wide scoring came from the eye-catching blows, but I don't think there was m enough eye-catching blows to warrant the scoring in the fight, especially 98, 92, and 97, 93. I could see Chavez winning 96, 94. That I can see, but at the end of the day, I, I just felt he didn't do enough. He landed good counters early, early in the fight, especially in th rounds three, four, and five, and, and, and six. But then after that, he sort of like, gassed out and, and he and, and and Vera pretty much dominated the last four rounds. And that was en that was enough for me for you know, I had it six rounds of four for um Vera and I thought that would be enough for Vera to carry the day, obviously, but I just I just don't think he did enough. And everything with Chavez in the fight was one punch. There was no combinations. There was no working behind a jab. It was always one shot, one heavy shot. And, and the crowd would really react to that one shot, but they would, like, they didn't seem, it just seemed like they, the one shots, the, the, the single shots was the ones that really affected the scoring. And I just don't see how a guy who, who throws maybe one or two punches every 15 to 20 seconds gets a decision. I just don't get it. I, I mean, I can understand him, I understand he landed the harder shots. But the, clearly, the busier guy was Vera, and he was more. And at times, he was more effective. And we know he's not the most skilled guy in the world, but he was more effective. He was pushing the fight. He was coming forward. He was landing shots. You know, it, after Chavez would land his one big bomb, Vera would land four or five punches. They, I, I, they weren't heavier than Chavez's blows, but they were still effective blows. And and. I just don't understand how anybody, how any judge, could could score it that wide. I mean, it wasn't like he was. Ch listen, every one round that Chavez won were close rounds. Well, oh, I'll say three out of the four were close. One of them was a big round. I think round, I believe, either I would say round six was his biggest round, where he really dominated the round. And but other than that, I just they're all close rounds, and I, I just thought that Vera did more because he was busier. And and you you notice that a lot of judges usually a lot of mo most judges like activity and busy busy fighters. They don't like you know one and two shots because even if they are heavy shots, they're not they're not carrying the fight. They're not pushing the fight. They're just you know they're just there in a way. So. I, I don't get where the judges I don't get I don't get the scoring of the fight at all. Um I think we should call out the judges. Uh give the names of these judges, especially the ones who gave the uh decision for shots Chavez by such a wide disparity. The ninety eight, ninety two to ninety seven well, I thought the 98, were ridiculous. Ninety two came from Guenadere and ninety seven, ninety three came from Marty Dangan. Now these two judges, I mean, they're usually good judges. Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to call corruption. I'm not going to scream robbery. I'm not going to scream Aaron had had the judges in the back pocket. There's no proof of that, so you can't say that. And people who are saying that are being stupid. They're not being realistic, and they're not being, you know, rational. Okay, you don't have any proof of it. You can't scream that out unless you have real proof of it, since it was a close fight. But I, but I understand why people are upset. But listen. Gwen Adair, I'll be honest, she's been in the game a very long time. Been Former years. referee, if Former I remember referee correctly. Too. She's been in the game a very long time, and she's usually a pretty good judge. And, and, and usually with her, it's very consistent. 
consistent scoring. So I, I really am surprised with that that card. And Marty Dankin's a good judge too. I've never thought of him as a corrupt, you know, judge or incompetent judge. Neither is Gwen Adair. I don't think she's corrupt or, or incompetent either. But they 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 seem to have they 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 had the widest scores. And that's what makes me wonder. But I can't I have no proof, so I can't say that. Um the the judge that had it the closest was her name is Carla Caiz. And we all know the Caiz is they're very prevalent in California boxing as refs and judges. Yes. Uh, um she had it the closest, but her scoring was very, very bizarre. Um, she gave the first four rounds to Vera, and then the last six to Chavez. Now, wait a second here. This is where I had the problem. You gave the last six to Chavez? Especially the last four rounds of the fight where it was clear Vera was, was in control and dominate. Like, his activity was enough to carry those rounds? And Chavez, who was clearly waiting out of shape, he was f fatigued badly. Yeah, he was fatigued. But he was he was gassed in round seven, eight, nine, and ten. He couldn't do anything in those rounds. He bar he could barely throw a punch. And when he did throw a punch, it was one big shot, and then he went back to retreating. So, I her scoring is bizarre. That that is a very strange scorecard. I I would love to know what she saw up up in front of the up near the ring that we didn't see. I just the scorecard is bizarre. How can you give the first four rounds for, for Vera? I disagree with giving the first four rounds of Vera. That's what, I, and then the next six rounds even is is even more of a head scratch. And I don't agree the way she scored the last six rounds. So I, I, I it's just really questionable judging all around. And the, it, it it just amazes me. It amazes me. That every week, like every week or almost every week, we have some sort of screwy scoring of a fight. I mean, and this is becoming commonplace. And I mean, yeah, people should say, oh, you should be used to it. I'm not used to it. I'll never get used to it because it's not fair. It, it's in. I don't know what to make of this. I'm not going to call Dankin or, you know, Adair corrupt or incompetent because they're usually good judges. Maybe they both had a bad night. Maybe it was just a coincidence they both had a bad night. But Carla Caiz is grossly incompetent, and she's borderline, to me, corrupt. Because you could, if you if you look at the, her scorecard, right? It was it was it was it was mind blowing. How and, she and, gave, and let me interrupt, kid. Let me interrupt. Excuse me. If you go to uh, fightnews.com and you scroll down. Uh, and you click on page three at the bottom of that uh, that site. Uh, on that on page three within FightNews.com, uh, they show the official scorecard from each judge. So to get you, so you can get your determination. To right, right. Score and what, and what I want to explain something to you. In the last round, okay, a round that Vera. It was a close round, but Vera clearly won the round. Two of the judges gave Vera the round. The only one that didn't give it to her was Kaiz. What was she watching? Was she having a conversation during the fight? Was she was she just not paying attention? I mean, I I don't understand these judges anymore. I don't understand. And California is pretty, you know, they're the judging there is pretty good. You know, in even Vegas, it's pretty good. But I just don't I, I I don't know. I don't know what they saw. I wish I wish some of these judges would get on the record and explain what they saw. So we yeah. we're not sitting here wondering are you a corrupt judge or are you an incompetent judge? You need these people need to get on the record. I I, I don't I know it's not gonna happen, but I think for a lot of fans they want they, they would rather want to hear from a judge why they scored something like that. I just feel it's 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 pertinent in in, in this era of, of of corrupt well not corrupt scoring but dodgy scoring, incompetent scorecards, even borderline corruption. We need some clarification here on what you're seeing because I don't think a lot of people understand judging completely, especially not most fans. I I, I mean I watch fights all the time. I watch everything and. I've developed, you know, a good eye for judging, and and I just don't see how anybody could get 
one of the judges gave eight out of ten rounds to Chavez. And then the other judge gave seven out of ten. There's something wrong there. And if it's not corruption or incompetence, it must have just been a coincidence of a bad night. And I don't know if it's a coincidence. I I, I really don't know. And, and and to be honest with you, I just wish, you know, there was some more more we can go on here. At least hear from one of the judges. You know? Like just just so we're not sitting here, you know, demeaning these people without having a clarification. That would be the best thing, I think is we have so many judges come on the record and explain their scoring. Because that, that would be helpful to, to, to boxing in general. See, for me, the thing is, look, I thought Chavez, I thought Vera won. Uh, I'm not mad that Chavez got the decision because the fight was pretty close. Uh, so I agree with you in that sense. So if it would have been Chavez by a point, by two points, okay, I'd have been fine with that. It was not just the the, the 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 wide margin within the two scorecards for me. My issues with Chavez, and I wrote a blog about this this week, uh, Pound for Pound Boxing Report blog page. Please please check it out. My issue with Chavez Jr. is the shenanigans that went on prior to the foul fight and even after the fight. Uh, the the fact that the fight was originally contracted for 162 pounds then move up to 168 because it could make 162 and everybody knew it was sense. And then the week of the fight, the contract was kind of, I don't know the word for it, but messed with for lack of a better word, so that the official weight was 173 instead of 168 because it was obvious that he couldn't make 168. He struggled to get down to 173. Hell, there were rumors before that during the week of the fight, Chavez was as high as 180. Then uh, he went to the sauna, had a what, spent 45 minutes or hour or so in the sauna. The day of the weigh-in, uh, his bad conditioning, his, his, his issue, issue of his bad preparation before the fight, the way he conducted himself with Jim Lapley out of the fight, complaining and this and that. Uh, and I'm thinking to myself, sir, you got the benefit of a, of the doubt in a big way, so you shouldn't really be complaining. Uh, to me. I look at Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., and I wrote this in this blog, and I'm not going to take it back. He, he acts like a fighter of privilege, uh, of hierarchy. He acts like a cat that has had a silver spoon in his mouth his entire career. And going forward, I don't see this really changing. Uh, where is the evidence in the past that he's taken any fight seriously? I mean, the biggest fight of his career against Sergio Martinez September 2012, the cat was smoking weed throughout training camp. Tested positive, nine month suspension. He comes back, he, surf he resurfaces at a way in. I can't remember the fight. Uh, and I was discussing this with uh, uh, on, on Twitter with, uh, with the boxing professor, Julian the Great. And we were discussing the fight Saturday night, doing a little bit of live tweeting. It looked like Chavez, we were guessing that Chavez had to be over 200 pounds when he started camp. And you saw him in the fight. This looked huge. I mean, he weighed in at 172, I believe it was, 172 and a half. Rumors were that he was, he weighed, he got into the ring that night at 186. Uh, he looked like a monster in there. So it's, it's, it's I just don't know exactly. I'm exasperated with this guy. I'm fed up with this guy and the way he really disrespects the sport by being so so much of a, a professional. It disgusts me, really. Listen, listen. I think he's had a silver spoon in his mouth for a very long time. I think he's very unprofessional. When you own a sports team at like 18 or 19 years old, you basically have had everything handed to you on a silver plate. Give us some backdrop on what sports team you're talking about for those who don't know. Um, I believe he owns a soccer team in Mexico. I don't know exactly which team off offhand, but but the point is he's been handed everything he's ever gotten in life. I mean, he's been handed, you know, his boxing career. Look look how long it took him to actually step up and fight someone. It took him over forty fights to actually step up and fight a live body. 
And even then, I, I mean, the live bodies he was fighting were suspect at best until he fought Sergio when Sergio wiped the floor with him outside of the last round. Um, I just think he was very unprofessional. First of all, I heard there was actually they amended the contract four times. Um, I heard it was originally signed at 162. Then there was some sort of change and they moved it up to 165. Then 68. And then 73. The 73 part was a surprise to, you know, to Vera and his camp when they arrived in, uh, you know, when they arrived in California. They were shocked. They're like, "What the hell?" They were never notified of this. They were notif never o o notified. Ronnie Shields was b beside himself. I've never seen Ronnie Shields that mad, and he's been in the game a long time as a trainer, and he's usually a mild mannered guy. And he Ronnie lost, Shields, a former fighter, a former fighter, and he lost. He he had he almost struck out over that. So that tells you how 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 incompetent and how unprofessional these people were going into the fight and they and, and and he was mad he said we agreed to these weights we kept we kept giving in to your to your you know your issues with training 173 is ridiculous um and he, he said if he and they 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 finally sat down and they talked but they agreed on 173 and Ronnie Shield said if this man is over 173 at the way in he he better start opening up his checkbook they were hot. They were they were livid. Vera and Ronnie Shield. They were absolutely livid that that this man walked in walked into this fight so out of, walked in to the week of the fight so out of shape. I heard he was like 185 pounds. He, he had and to be more than that. He had to be because I heard he was 185 or 190. Actually, let me on, on Twitter the the rumors were running rapid that he entered the ring at 186. And like I said, I was on this. I was on Twitter doing some live tweeting with um. Julian yeah, yeah, no, I know when he entered the ring, but the rumors were the week of the fight he was either one hundred oh, or one hundred ninety pounds. Supposedly, I, I I don't I don't agree with those rumors completely, but I do agree if you were to give him a a, a significant a certain weight, I would say around one eighty. The week of the fight, and they just, I just think their whole camp was one big joke. That's what they thought. They thought Brian, v they thought this fight would be a joke. They thought Brian Vera wouldn't be hungry. He wouldn't come in and want to fight. He would just come here for the payday. You gotta understand, if they if they thought that of Brian Vera, they don't know Brian Vera. They don't know what that in what's inside that man. That man is a tr is he works hard. He's a, he's a very dedicated fighter. Forget how many losses he has. Forget the the losses don't mean anything, okay? Because I think he's a lot better fighter than you know than his record would indicate. And, and he and he worked hard for this fight. He trained very hard. He had to eat just to make 170. Eat actually yes. physically eat. That's how small he is compared to this compared to to the to the unprofessional and fat cell Chavez because Chavez was straight up fat. That was an out of shape man, and I, I'll say this: to be honest with you, I don't believe he was 186 pounds when he stepped into that ropes. I don't care what anybody says. I don't believe he was. I believe he was more than that. I believe he was a lot more than that. I wouldn't be surprised if he was closer to 190 or even over that. I don't believe 186 for one one second because that's probably what his camp said. 186. They're trying to downplay everything. Listen, people. And Chavez is a disrespectful punk to begin with. You come in out of shape like that. You, you should be you should be treated as as such, not not coddled by top rank. You should be treated as what you, you're acting, and that's unprofessional. I, I personally, I, I, I'm outraged that this was even allowed to go on. How can you amend the contract four times? What kind of what kind of fighter is this? This is not a fighter. A fighter doesn't do this. A fighter doesn't go around. Not training and thinking this is one big joke. A real fighter's in the gym, training hard, getting ready. This guy think think this guy is a partier. This is obvious. This guy goes out and parties. His life is one big party, and 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 because since his he, his dad is you know is is one of the most famous fighters in the world and maybe one of the great one of the greatest ever, which is 
you know, Mexican fighters, I should say, ever. Um, there's no motivation, I guess. There's no motivation to do anything right. It's half-assing it. It, it, it. They go. They, I think Chavez really has never done a hard days of, day of work in his life ever. I truly believe it. If he can come in that out of shape for a fight and and continually get passes, like especially in the Rubio fight for being grossly out of shape, this man has never done anything remotely hard in his life. He's probably trained, but he's never really trained hard. He's never gone balls to the wall. He doesn't take the sport seriously. We shouldn't take him seriously. And and, and the fact of the matter is, him talking about, oh, I, 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 I he was headbutting me. I broke my hand. Listen, mo listen, dude. Listen, dude. <laughs> I know what you was listen, about to say. Dude. Listen, dude. <laughs> I caught myself there because <laughs> that's how mad it makes me. Listen, dude, you're a fighter. Headbutts and breaking your hand is part of the game. If you cannot handle that, you need to find something else to do. This isn't knitting, okay? This is boxing. And, and, and you're going on TV crying to Jim Lampley. Who cares? You know what? I've seen fighters with worse – I've there's been plenty of fighters with worse injuries carry on in a fight and didn't quit. And didn't complain at the end. So this this kid's not a fighter. He doesn't have the mentality of a fighter. He doesn't have the intestinal fortitude to be a fighter. Everything about him doesn't scream fighter. It screams as a coddled baby, who thinks that his that his you know his he thinks he's you know great because he has a name. First of all, your name gets you in the door. It, what you do with it determines your success. And Absolutely. That's that's all I have to say on that. Yeah. Um, first of all, we mentioned Ronnie Shields earlier. Kudos to Ronnie Shields for sticking on his feet. Yes, he was upset about the nonsense regarding the weight, but he had the sense enough to say, okay, you want us to fight it this way? You're going to have to shell out more money. And reportedly, to the tune of $275,000, that, that Brian Vero got paid extra from Chavez as a result of Chavez's lack of professionalism, him coming in just fat and out of shape. Yeah, and I also Tom heard they, they also added a penalty. Like they got something negotiated where if he came in over 173, he was going to get more money on top of that. Mm. So they, mm. they were they, – he did – listen, Ronnie wasn't playing around. He's been in the game a very long time, and he, he's a former fighter, and he's, he's, he's the kind of – Guy that believes that if you're gonna if you're fight if if he has a fighter and the, and the opponent's got to come in professional because that's all Ronnie was in his career as a fighter he was professional and he expects everything everybody else to be professional and this man simply wasn't professional. Yes, uh, you mentioned time right. Moving forward, what do you think is the future for Chavez? I know they're talking about a rematch between him and Vera. Personally, I kind of doubt it, but. What do you think of the future for Tom Rank? I think if the Vera rematch doesn't happen, shoot. I think Tom Rank at this point is kind of fed up. Boxing fans are fed up. I think they'll throw him in with the Andre Ward. Ward will give him a spanking, and they'll be done with him. Yeah, I don't see I don't see um, this ever going any you know further. Like I like I don't see them building him anymore or trying to make him something worthwhile for HBO because it, we, we all know that his, listen, based on last night, the fact of the matter is this shows you how how fast Chavez Jr.'s fan base is, was whittling away. They went from having the fight, it was supposed to be October 14th or 15th, 13th or something like that. They are supposed to have it at the Staples Center. Then Chavez suffered a cut, okay, which was a legit injury. I believe, in a way, they kind of milked it a little bit, but whatever. Um, and and I believe he wasn't in shape at that point either. Um, and then they they pushed it back two weeks, but they they put the fight in Carson, California. Okay, that's a downgrade in venue. Obviously, they weren't selling tickets at Staples. Chavez Jr. is clearly not a drawer anymore. I think after the, the the Sergio beating, I think a lot of fans realize this guy isn't 
isn't what they say he is, and they've just jumped. They've jumped off the bandwagon. Clearly. I don't even think it was the Sergio Bennett because keep in mind that Chavez Jr. got a lot of praise following that fight just based on what he did in the last round, last two rounds. I think right, people right, are fed also, up with Chavez' actions after that fight up until now. Yeah, yeah. I think, but I think to a degree, I think there were some Chavez fans that jumped off the bandwagon, even though box the boxing community praised him. For his guts and heart and determination in that last round against Martinez, um, I think there were some people that jumped off the bandwagon. But I think a lot of people jumped off once there was the the, 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 the positive test for for the marijuana, and then this whole charade, this entire you know this entire last week and leading up to the Vera fight, it was nothing but a horse and pony show. It really was, and it was, and it was a sad indictment of our sport that this is what it's becoming—a horse and pony show. It's, it's not about competing in the ring as equals. It's about, it's becoming a sport where the meet, where the some guy gets into the media and creates a, a show and a circus. And I don't think that's what boxing should be. It, it shouldn't be about it. We shouldn't be sitting here discussing, you know, a guy being unprofessional. We be, should be discussing the fight. And we're sitting here discussing how unprofessional a fighter is. And, 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 and we need to get away from that. We need to get back to the sport, the actual sport, actually competing in the ring. Not, not this nonsense outside the ring. Yeah, completely agree. And I'll uh, give a comment from uh, YouTube since we're live on YouTube right now. Um, Adam Molina. Molinar, excuse me if I pronounce your last name wrong, saying that if it's a senior level fighter at best, the fact that a rematch is even being discussed is not good for Chavez stock, and I'll agree with that. Um, it really speaks to, well, I think Vera is a good, decent fighter, but nothing special. So the fact that they're talking about it, I don't think it will happen. It's not even good for Chavez. I would completely agree with that. Let's move on to. Yeah, I wanted um, to say really quick uh -huh. to his comment. I think Vera is a lot, a little bit better than a C level fighter. That being said, I think you're absolutely right. This speaks to how far Chavez Jr. stock has fallen. This is the, the, the fact that that Bob is even entertaining a rematch with Vera. You see, Bob wouldn't be entertained. Usually, if if there if if Chavez Jr. wasn't hurting at the box office. They'd be moving on from this, but it's clear he's hurting at the box office. He's hurting, he's hurting, you know, top rank as a company. And I think the next, very next fight will truly be a cash out if it's not a fight with Vera. It will be a cash out. They'll put him in with Ward, or or, or somebody, or Golovkin maybe at a catch rate or something, and, and just be done with it. There's no more, you know, you know, coddling this kid. There's nothing else they can do. Yes, yeah, so let's move on to. Some other bouts that happened this weekend. Double header that happened in Montreal. Uh, headlined by Adonis Stevenson scoring a seventh round TKO over Tavares Cloud. Stevenson defended his WBC light heavyweight belt. Varying opinions on this. Um, look, I think Tavares Cloud, he was basically ex exposed by Campillo, further exposed by Hopkins as being based a one dimensional fighter who's not that active, not that much of a boxer, guy who really doesn't think. But but that with with that being said, I think Stevens he put on a good performance. Uh, he showed much more skill than I had seen him in some previous bouts. Uh, those who do not have, have not seen him, he showed that he's much more than just a power puncher. Um, but let's put it all in perspective. While Stevenson did look good, uh, look at the opponent. He wasn't active. He didn't fight with any real passion, as far as I was concerned. Um, as good as Stevens looked. Uh, Tavares Cloud kind of made it easy for him Saturday night. Yeah, for Adonis, this was just easy work for Adonis. If to just to take a phrase from Floyd Mayweather, um, and I think he, I think he just listen. Stevenson did what he wanted to do the entire fight. He was able to jab, create this, create distance with the jab when he wanted to. He could land a clean uppercut when he wanted to. He could land clean punches to the head and body when he wanted to, mostly to the head. And he just took care of business and 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 he was apt, he was just fought a much smarter fight. Even showboated. Even showboated when you're when your opponent when Stevenson when you're being showboated 
by a guy, you know, that means you're being dominated. You, you there's nothing you, there was nothing that really Tavoris, there was no change in Tavoris's game plan. There, there was nothing there. There was absolutely nothing there. All he did was walk around and follow Stevenson. He did that in the, in the Hopkins fight, and he and he did that in the Campillo fight. All he did was follow this guy around and just not let his hands go. Um, and and Stevenson just took the initiative from round one. He and landed some clean shots. One shot actually hurt um, hurt actually Tavares's eye, because, and I don't think he was ever the same after that. He was always blinking that one eye. Must have must have damaged the uh, the cornea or something, but that was a very clean and hard punch. Um, he just Stevenson did a very good job with the jab, creating space and distance and 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 and, and making Tavares you know wary of coming in and pressing the fight. There was he had, Cloud had no answer for the jab. He did nothing to to stop. You know Stevenson from throwing the jab. He did nothing. He did nothing in general. I mean, I that was a complete manhandling. Simply because Cloud just had no confidence to let his hands go. And usually after a fight with Hopkins, you really don't have confidence in letting your hands go, in fear of being countered. But this guy did nothing. He he just walked around the entire fight, following Stevenson, did not cutting off the ring. You know, following around, getting getting nailed with, with with quick shots, Stevenson moving away, and then back to you know Cloud following him again. It was a, it was a really good performance for for Stevenson, but I'm not going to say it was a great performance because simply because Cloud did nothing. Cloud did nothing to test Stevenson, but I will say we've seen more skill from Stevenson in this fight than we had in the past, and I think. That bodes well for for a possible fight with um, Kovalev, and I'll and I'll get into that w once we just start discussing the future of Stevenson. But I think he showed a lot of more dimensions in this fight than he did in in the, you know in his previous fights, because we all thought he was just a puncher, you know, a pure puncher that just knocked guys out with one jab. Stevenson showed in this fight he can be a boxer puncher, which is which is you know. Yeah, I guess he, a, a, an old dog can learn new tricks simply because Stevenson's on the, on the other side of 30 and he's showing all these different things now that we hadn't seen before. So at the end of the day, it was a good performance, but it wasn't a great performance simply because his opponent did nothing. And that's not Adonis's fault. That's that's the other guy's fault. And I just also want to mention, Tavares' cloud trainer, tr trainer, where, that guy Albanani, he needs to find another profession. That that he offered no advice whatsoever. He he's telling he just basically told Tavares, "You're in great shape. Go to the body. Do this. Do that." But he was giving no information on how to do it. I, I mean, he he was better off staying with 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 Abel Sanchez if he was going to get this type of training from this. This hack, he could have, he could have at least stayed with Abel. At least he would have done better with Abel. This, this guy had it was was completely um, and utterly clueless. He he didn't know what he was doing. Uh, and and to give you some background information on Mr. Benani, Mr. Benani was is actually Cloud's manager. Um, he also he's also was is a former matchmaker for um, a couple of promotions, notably Don King. But it was just a, a really good performance. I can't give. Did somebody I, say conflict of interest? Yeah, pretty much. But whatever. But whatever. It, it's boxing. That's usually what happens in boxing. A bunch of conflict of interest. But at the end of the day, I think Stevenson did very good. He did what he had to do, and he won the fight. But I'm not gonna say it was an outstanding performance because I'm not gonna sit there like. You know, like Max Kellerman going gaga over a guy that did nothing, and one guy doing all the action. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. I refuse to buy into that. You know, that hype. Uh, you mentioned Kovalev and the future of Stevenson. Let's talk about it right now. Uh, Stevenson has a upcoming mandatory defense against Tolibello of England. He has to fight that first. 
even though in the interview with HBO after the fight, Stevenson was talking about he wants Hopkins. Uh, word has already started this week that HBO is pushing towards a Madonna Stevenson Sergey Kovalev bout early next year. Word is that they're going to be fighting together on a card possibly as early as late November, November 30th, with Stevenson fighting Bello and Kovalev appearing on the undercard. Do you think Kent, that this Stevenson Kovalev bout is going to happen? I know all over Twitter, especially, they've been clamoring for that bout ever since, ever since uh, Kovalev destroyed Nathan cleverly. Um, or do you think the fight will happen? Will happen? Because I know HBO is, they certainly want Stevenson and Kovalev. And personally, and looking at it, I want that fight too. I think we'll see Stevenson Kovalev. But I don't think it'll be right away like HBO thinks it's going to happen. I truly think that if if his promoter has any say, we're going to have a, the fight with the um, the winner of Pascal and Boutte before they fight Kovalev because I think they want to you know maximize their profit to the to the nth degree. They want to make the most money they can make out of this, and I think that's what they're going to do. I I have no doubt the fight will happen. It just won't be happening on HBO schedule unless unless some, there's something we don't know but I, I don't think it'll be be right after fighting Bello but be it as it may um, Stevenson right now is in well he firmly cem cemented himself in the driver's seat um, he, right he's gonna take his fight with Bello which I don't think he'll have a much of a problem with I think he wins that fight rather easily and by knockout and then Let's just say, for argument's sake, Kovalev and Stevenson is after the Bellu fight. I don't think it's going to be... Uh, I don't think Kovalev necessarily wins easily. Or I don't even think Stevenson wins. I think it's going to be a close fight. I think it'll end in knockout, but I think it'll be a close fight. I, the, 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 the part of me that makes me curious is, since Stevenson showed you know, a lot more dimensions... Would that be troublesome to somebody like Kovalev? I mean, would would this even the speed? Because there's definitely a speed difference between Stevenson and Kovalev. Stevenson's clearly faster. Um, how will Steve, uh, Kovalev handle that? How will he handle um, Stevenson boxing from the outside, from the outside, and not trying to engage with with Kovalev? How is that going to work? I mean, I want to see that wh how Kovalev deals with that. If he's able to deal with it and cut off the ring and go to the body, I mean, he'll he'll win by knockout, Kovalev, because I think he hits much harder. Um, but if he's not able to do that, I think Stevenson wins a decision. Or, or, or well, you know what? I actually not a decision. I think Stevenson wins a late stoppage because I think if 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 Kovalev doesn't, you know, respond to the speed well and is just sitting there as a, as a target. I just see Stevenson beating him up and stopping him. I, 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 I'm, I'm inclined to go with the Kovalev stoppage, but it's, it's a 50-50 fight, really. I, I just don't see it being any, any leaning towards one particular guy. Um, but it, it, it should be an interesting fight. I'm looking forward to it if if it comes off. Yeah, you know, early 2014. Yeah, especially given the way that Stevenson looked. Um, I think if he moves around and shows the movement and the uh, skill that he showed uh, against Tavares Cloud, he can certainly give Kovalev a bout because Kovalev has never seen anything like that before, particularly from a southpaw stance. So that will be an interesting bout. Let's just hope it uh, comes off in 2014. Let's talk about the undercard. L. Stevenson's cloud. Jean-Claude Pascal fighting on the undercard, scored a fifth-round stoppage over George Blades. Look, this was a tune-up bout for everybody. That Everybody knows that Pascal's set to fight Lucien Boutte in Montreal in January. Uh, as much as the result, the, what I was looking at was how would Pascal look given his history of shoulder problems really for the past couple of years. He didn't have any issues with that fight, but Blaze is, you know, C-level fighter at best, at best. But 
Cloud looked pretty. I mean, Jean Pascal looked pretty decent in this performance, Ken. Yeah, I, I think he. I think personally, he took some rounds, you know, just to warm up. I, I don't. I don't think he ever. He really had trouble with blades. I think he was basically toying with him the first three or four rounds, which I can. I can understand since considering he hadn't been in a ring in so long. You know, he needed some ring work, and he got it. You know, he he. And but then when it when it came down to finishing the fight, he finished it. Right. He had to do. He took care of business, and that's the important thing. That at the end of the day, when he was done getting his ring in ring work, in, he just finished the job. He got the man out of there. Um, I think the, uh, the 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 crowd in Quebec was kind of critical of him, especially in those early rounds, warming up. They were like booing, and they were yelling bullshit, and you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, they're some tough fans. They want they wanted John to finish the job. And I understand that, but but I but that I just shows that they're probably more f- fans of Pascal than actually sitting down and actually watching boxing. Um because if you actually sit down and watch boxing as often as we do, I mean you understand that he had to get some work in. He had to he couldn't just take him out like that. It would have been nice, but it wouldn't have helped him. He needed some ring, ring, you know, some ring time in there to get warmed up and to, to shake off some of the rush. And that's what he did. That was basically what this fight was about. And I, I can't really, the issue I, I can't this. really comment on it because it was such a one-sided fight. Even though, you know, um, Pascal toyed with him, drew most of the three and four rounds that he was toying with him. And it just, it just, you could just see the skill level was just, there was no comparison. Blade, Blades was there as a punching bag. That's all he was. And, 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 and Pascal handled business. Um, and I, and I hope, you know, that the, his fight with Boutte is, is a good fight because it kind of needs to be because we, we, we haven't seen Boutte in a while either. I wonder if he's going to take a tune up now. To try to outdo Pascal, like to fight somebody and say, "Yeah, I I, I took my tune up and I did better than you," because that would make it for an interesting fight between them if if Butte were to do that. I doubt it. I doubt it. Yeah, uh, but then, but if if Butte doesn't take a tune up, then he's been out of the ring a year. But you Over. have to remember, Butte was out originally because of what was it—a cut eye? He don't want to um, get an into a about and possibly get cut again. Yeah, that's true too. But I, I, I think if they do get him in the ring with somebody, it'll be somebody like a Blades type that he can just take care of business against. But I, I think he should take that fight. But you, you, you do have a point with the cut. You don't want to risk it. You don't want to risk him busting open, uh, open again. And there goes the fight being delayed again. And, and you know, and you know, Pascal is probably on on a short leash anyway with this fight being delayed. So if he gets cut again. Pascal, Pascal could just say, "Forget this. I'm gonna just go go a different direction. I, I'll, I'll go I'll go ask Stevenson for a fight because I I know what that's what Pascal would do because he want he wants to get in the ring. He want and and I'll be honest with you. I think Pascal and Boutte are on borrowed time anyway. Um, I think it's coming down to the end of the road for both of them, and I think they just want to make the most money possible out of this. That's why they're fighting. And I wouldn't be surprised if Boutte and Pascal were out of the sport in the next couple of years, to be honest with you. Yeah, interesting. Let's move on and talk about the boxing news that we're down this week, really for the past couple of weeks. Uh, rumors broke out early this week. I heard about it yesterday, I think, roof, that uh, there's been talk of Floyd Mayweather fighting Amir Khan in May 2014. Now, Team Khan came out with a statement today, I believe, yes, today, issuing that, denying the rumors of a Mayweather fight, but rumors are running rampant. started with the London Daily Mail when they reported an uh, official announcement that the fight will be made for Khan Mayweather in the next few days, that he's going to pull out of his December 7 proposed bout with Devin Alexander, and then Khan went into a seven-month training camp with Virgil Hunter to prepare for Mayweather. Uh, your thoughts on this bout and the rumors running back rampant, whether it will happen, whether it will not happen. Uh, I ultimately think it will happen. 
And if it does, Khan should be ticked off. Uh, what do you think about this rumors of uh, Khan Mayweather for May? It's a waste of time, personally. It's not a fight. I mean, the only thing I could see troubling Mayweather is the speed. And that's about it. Khan's speed. Other than that, Khan, Khan is, 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 is fragile. You know, his durability has always been questioned. His chin is not that good. He can't take a really good punch or at least a, a halfway decent one. And I just don't see the point to this fight. All it is is a cash grab to me. It's just a payday for Khan because I think Khan knows his days in the sport are numbered. And Floyd has to, you know, has to um, have another one of his uh, fights on the contract. So I guess this is his freebie, which I think is a real freebie. I mean, it's as bad as easy as an opponent as you can get. I, I just don't think it's – I think it's a waste of time. I think Floyd wins by knockout within the first four or five rounds. I, I just don't see this being an ag or anything competitive. Maybe for, for a round, maybe it will be competitive. But Floyd will show his class. See, here's and I take care of business, and I just don't. I think it's a waste of time, and I think it's a waste of money actually for pay for people because we all know Floyd is going to probably charge about seventy bucks for this garbage. And 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 I'm not trying to be critical of Floyd. I understand he wants to make money. That's fine. You want to make money, good. But for 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 hard for for, for fans who pay good money to see him fight Canelo. You know, in that type of fight, which was a lot better fight, and then and then then expect people to pay another seventy dollars for him to fight Khan. That's ridiculous. Good, good, hard, hardcore fans should not be paying that type of money for that type of fight. That is that that fight's a waste of time. It's just filling space. It's it's doing nothing for, for Floyd's legacy, and he has a questionable legacy to begin with. So. Any type of this fight, this fight should not be happening. I, I don't want to box fans, like I said. Like I, I don't want to see the fight. I don't know how you feel, Mike. I know a lot of other people don't want to see the fight, but I don't want to see it. I, I think it's a waste of time. I think it's time filler. I don't even think it's uh, meaningful at all. It doesn't determine anybody's. You know, it doesn't determine. You know, like at the end of the day, it doesn't do anything for Floyd's legacy. Everybody would say, "Oh, well, we all knew he could, would be con." It does nothing. Yeah, for, for for serious boxing fans, especially like ourselves, this is a step down. Um, there's no no hell well way I pay uh, pay per view out to watch this fight. Nah, -uh. um, you're right. Look, here's the thing about con. Physically, in terms of speed, power, and whatnot, and even to a certain level of skill. He could give Mayweather some problems, just based solely on that. The problem is his chin, number one, and number two. The problem is is a lack of discipline in the ring. It's like he's it's like he's a guy who has a bad chin, who does not have the sense enough to fight like a guy who knows he has a bad chin. You know what I mean? Yeah, he does it. Listen, he does for some reason for a guy that knows he has a glass jaw, glass chin, or whatever, he doesn't bite, He doesn't have a very high boxing IQ. Right. And I think what the problem is, and I'll tell you what the problem is, I think when he's engaged into a real fight and he's hurt, he wants to fight back. He wants to show people, yeah, he hurt me, but I can hurt him. And he gets into this macho thing, which is, which is not a very smart thing to do when you're, when you're vulnerable and, and your durability is already extremely questionable. Um, and I just don't see any reason why the fight should happen. We know what's going to happen. It's inevitable what's going to happen. Floyd's going to knock him out. And we're all going to say, yeah, we already knew he was going to knock him out. And he's going to get a lot of outrage from, from hardcore fans that already question his legacy as it is for this fight. The only people that will be happy he got the knockout will be Flomo's. Those are the only people that'll be happy is Flomos. Sorry, I, I don't mean to hurt anybody, any Floyd, you know, fans' feelings, but that's the only people that'll be happy are Flomos. Nobody else will be happy. 
everybody would be criticizing the fight, saying, well, why did he take this fight? It does nothing for him. This is what I don't what I don't get with Floyd sometimes. Floyd, one minute, is going to take a step into the right direction by fighting Canelo. And I gave him so much credit for taking a fight. But then he takes a complete two steps down. That just shows you what I think of Khan. Like, like I thought, you know, Canelo is a B-level fighter at, you know, at his really best, at his utmost best. But at the end of the day, it was still a very good fight for Floyd to take. But then he goes down and fights maybe a C-level fighter in Khan. I think he's a C-level fighter. I'll tell you why. It's not his skill, and it's not the guys he's fighting. It's fighting. his beard. It's his beard that makes him a C-level fighter. His beard, his beard can't he can't take a punch. Listen, he he could, if 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 Floyd lands a lands a really stiff jab, I bet you he'll go at his he'll 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 do it his legs will, will do a jiggle. That's how bad his chin is. And I don't want to criticize a guy. I mean, but there's no there's nothing you can't sugarcoat it. It's not a good fight. And Khan is going to probably be wheeled out of there, and that's the facts. And, and, and I hope, I, I really hope that this fight doesn't happen. And if it does, you, I won't be shelling out 70 bucks to watch this. I'm sorry. I love boxing. I love the sport, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'll do anything for the sport. But this is, this is an outrage if this fight happens. Yes, let's move on. Some more news on the, on the ledger. Darren Barker uh, set to defend his, uh, make the initial defense of his IBF middleweight title against Felix Sturm in Germany in December. When he won the belt uh, okay. last month, uh, I was saying that he was going to fight Sturm next, and doggone it, it's, it's going to happen. Um, your initial thoughts on this fight with Felix Sturm? You know what? I think Sturm is in decline. But something tells me I wouldn't be surprised if he were to pull out the win in this fight. Yeah, I'm favoring Sturm in this fight. I think he's technically better. He's a better boxer. You know, you know what makes Barker dangerous is his power. And and I I even noted that in the in the fight with Gil, that that's the one thing about him that would that that really really made an imprint in that fight, and that's probably why he won the fight, and why people you know favored him is because of the punching power. He hits hard. There's no doubt about that. But I just think Sturm is a much smarter fighter. He's a much more craftier fighter. He has a higher boxing IQ. And he's just going to stick behind the jab and, 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 and you know, use his hand speed, go to the body, go to the head, fight very, very smart. Where, you know, I think he's going to wear Barker down and he's going to win a a, a fairly comfortable decision. I just, I, it's possible that that Barker catches him with a with a shot and hurts him, and and and, and there's it, it always that chance. And there's also also a chance that Barker may may show some more, you know, things when it comes down to you know his skill. But I just don't see Barker winning. I, I the, the one of the funniest things that's coming out of this fight is that. Barry Hearn is talking about an immediate rematch. Where was that for the for the, for the Gill fight? Because the Gill fight was close enough that you could mandate a rematch. Where's the rematch for that fight? But it's okay for the Sturm fight, I guess, because you're making more money. But at the, but the, if you're gonna use the principle of getting a rematch for the Sturm fight, then you should use should have used it for the Gill Gill fight in event of a close one, in which that was a close fight. So I, 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 it's it just showing once again that Matchroom Sport is like any other promoter. They don't care about what the fans think, and they're going to do what they want. And and I and I and I think that Matchroom. I mean, even though they're, I, I'm starting to really question their business practices. They they poach fighters. They you know they. You know they, they, there was a questionable decision in a fight where Ricky Burns clearly lost. And he's he didn't even have the sense of mind to give Gil a, a rematch, even a rematch, even though he was the defending champion. See where I'm getting at? Mm -hmm. See how I hear you. like the political stuff that this company's doing? 
it, 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 it amazes me. It amazes me. I don't. Hey, he's no better. Listen, Barry Hearn is no better than any other promoter. He's the same, and it's going to remain the same until you know there's somebody that's going to come along and change this because this this this, this, this po the politics needs to stop, especially on the promoter promotional side. And and it and it and, and it probably won't, but at the end of the day, it needs to slow down because people are starting to see it for what it is. And you can't keep doing that to fans. You can't keep doing over and over and over. Because fans are starting to catch on to the shenanigans. And it, and, and, it, and it's ridiculous that he didn't even he couldn't even give Gil a rematch. That was a close fight. You could have gave Gil a, at least a rematch. But you ran and wanted to make the biggest, make the most money and fight Stern. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I just don't think, I just, I thought he should have gave Gil the rematch first, but whatever. It is what it is, but I think Storm beats him anyway, so it doesn't matter. This is uh, the next thing. Next place I want to go is not really boxing news per se. Uh, I want to give you the form, the platform, Kent, uh, to respond to some of the things that were said on our last show. For those who don't know, we did a special live episode immediately following Floyd Mayweather's win over Canelo Alvarez the live show slash podcast and I know you had some comments in response to uh, some of the comments there particularly on the YouTube channel which you kind of took offense to I took offense to it as well but I want to give you the platform to really uh, say what you had to say in response to that Ken. Well you know what I just got the sense that there was a bunch of people on there who are Floyd fans, like really Floyd fans, they're not boxing fans per se. They're not, they don't watch every fight. They don't sit there like us and watch every fight, every all the fights. They just watch when Floyd fights. And I just thought a lot of their, their comments were out of line and, 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 and completely moronic. And it bothers me because we, we kind of pride ourselves as giving, you know, as trying to give, you know, you know, try to give a good platform, and and we don't, we try not to say stupid things, and we not, and and, and I just felt like these 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 group of idiots, not all of them were idiots, but a major a major a big part of the, the idiots, we're we're kind of like saying that we don't know nothing because we don't kiss Floyd's ass. Well, we're not here to kiss Floyd's ass, you. Leonard, that's Leonard Ellerby's job to kiss his ass. That's not our job. We don't. We're not on his payroll. Okay. And if I want to say that 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 Floyd dominated the first half, and he didn't do his, he didn't dominate in the second half, and, and I, I I don't think he dominated the fight. That's my opinion. Okay. You don't have to like my opinion. And I already knew that that that, that the Flomos were going to come out in full force when I said that. Because they never like hearing when 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 Floyd, you know, doesn't it, it isn't lauded with with with, with praise and, and and love and this gross, you know, ass kissing. That's just not my job. It's not my job to ass kiss Floyd. And if I'm gonna say something about Floyd's career, I'm gonna say it. L listen, I I would suggest to these people who who. Are, are Flomos, and I looked at you all your accounts, and I can tell who the boxing fans are, and the real boxing fans, and who are just Floyd fans. I can tell you most of you are just Floyd fans, because I didn't see one thing about boxing, one thing. And you're gonna sit here and like tell us like we don't know nothing, that we should just sh that 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 because I said that that. That Floyd didn't dominate the fight. I he won the fight. I admit he won the fight. Okay, and I know he won the fight. Okay, understand that. I know he won the fight, but he didn't dominate. Not to me, anyway. To other people, maybe, but I'm not in that in that group. And there's other people that thought he won 116, 112. I'm not the only one, and it doesn't make us, you know, it doesn't make us uneducated about the sport. But for people that come around and comment on the on the damn on the damn comment box and make stupid comments, they should get they're being treated the exactly the way the way they should be treated as stupid because they came all on the thing and made these ridiculous comments insulting Mike, insulting me, insulting you know 
our guest. It's ridiculous. You know what? If you don't like what we're saying about Floyd, you don't have to watch. I'll tell you this. If, I hope if we ever do a show on Floyd, you don't show up. Oh, man, you, you're you not going to like me. You're not going to like any of us even more because we're not going to sit here and coddle him. That's Showtime's job. That's, that's Leonard Ellerby's job. That's Al Heyman's job to paint him in a positive light and kiss his butt. We don't kiss anybody's butt. We don't have an agenda here. We're doing this on our own dime pretty much. We do our own thing outside of this. We're not sitting here, you know. We we we're not making money off of this. We're just boxing fans. But and and for people to come, I I mean, I wouldn't get angry normally, but it was just, but it was borderline derogatory almost. The comments, just the the comments, like, oh, you don't know nothing, and and if you you went to any gym, this is what one of them said. If you went to any gym, you know that they would say Floyd can compete in any era. You know what? That's a truthful statement, but guess what? We don't know if he can compete in any any other era because this is the weakest era in, in, in boxing history. So anybody who's mad because I didn't say he dominated, well, that's fine. You know what? You don't have to agree with me. But at the end of the day, I would I would I would have appreciated if they were a little bit more respectful. They didn't have to come dogging, dogging us on the comment because there was about four or five of them that came on dog us. Like questioned our 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 you know knowledge of the sport. Listen, just because we don't endear and give Floyd all the con all the praise in the world, doesn't mean we don't know nothing. We just are a unbiased source. If you want if you want a biased source, there's plenty of other places where you can be indulged in that information. But this is an unbiased show. You get what you get. If you don't like hearing it, you don't have to listen. But I know these people are still listening. They have to be listening. Why would you come out of your way to make, you know, those comments if you aren't listening? So I, I'd expect those people to still listen, but they won't say much unless it comes to Floyd again. And I, and I'm sure I, I'm sure some of them are, are, are hopping mad right now because I said the the con fight was bad. It is a bad fight. You, you, you Floyd fans can't deny it. It is a bad fight, and they want to laud him with credit for fighting a, a, a chinless wonder. That's that's their business, not mine. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I just never – I felt I, – I was I was genuinely annoyed by that. I yeah. mean, it's not like it's, – it's not like we haven't gotten those comments before, but it, I just felt it went too far, what was being said. You got a point there. Um, I want to read a couple of comments in the chat uh, on YouTube right now. There's one, uh, Sweet Boxing, uh, who joined us. Thanks for joining us on the show. Uh, saying that uh, in response to what you just said, using the word flomo makes one looks bad. Uh, just rise above the criticism. Call things like you see it and move on. And let me say this. You have a point. Uh, but at the same time, uh, while you mentioned Ken's use of that word flomo makes one look bad. Okay, right. But there were some comments there that were worse, way worse than what Ken said. It wasn't just the fact that they questioned our intelligence as boxing man and fans. And I could I could have shot back by saying for you to say that Floyd Mayweather Jr. was better than Sugar Ray Robinson and that Sugar Ray Robinson never fought anybody. I could question your intelligence and respond, but I chose not to do that. Uh, it was how personal some of the comments got. Not only live during the show, but after the show as well. I think that, and I'll speak for you, Ken, you can respond. I think that's what has you upset. Not just the stuff about questioning our, our boxing intelligence, but how personal some of the comments got both during the show and particularly after we finished the show and the subsequent in the two weeks or so since we've done that episode. Yeah, I, listen, I usually rise above criticism and say what I have to say. And I never respond to any of these idiots. I usually don't. But and, it, and clarify what you mean by FOMO. That's just listen, short for listen, Floyd Mayweather listen, fans. That's not no it's not homophobic insult, reference it's not or anything insult, like that. But you know what? I could see where somebody takes it as an insult. Um, but looking at the comments, you could just see what they are. And I just called it the way it is. And, and you know what? I didn't say it's the weakest error in boxing history. This is not 
the weakest, but it, it is one of the weakest. And and I and I stand by that, and and I and I'm not and I'm not gonna, you know, say something's great if it's it's pretty bare. I mean, I'll be honest with you. When you have so many champions that are interim champions and all that, it is a weak era. And let me chime in right quick, quick Kent. Excuse me for interrupting. And Sweet Box respond by saying this is the weakest boxing era in history, all weight classes combined. I wouldn't go there, but when you look at the welterweight junior middleweight division alone. Sure, it's weak. I mean, this is in the 1990s when you had Corte, Trinidad, De La Hoya, Jose, Jose Luis uh, Lopez, fighters like that. Um, this is in certainly the era of the 70s when you had Duran, Hearns, Popino Cuevas, Carlos Palomino, even before that, Jose Napoles, fighters like that. So, sure, it's weak. And, and when you, we all know the heavyweight division is weak. Look, you got Golovkin at middleweight. You got Sergio Martinez at middleweight, super middleweight. Oh, Andre Ward. But I would argue that the 160, 160 pound era of the 1990s with Jones, Tony, Hopkins, Nigel Benn, Chris Eubank, Steve Collins, Frankie Lyles was way better than what we see at 160, 168 now. And I'm missing some fighters at that during that era. Um, look at the lower weight divisions. Fly from, say, straw weight up to flyweight, junior banner weight. Sure, you got the Roman Gonzalez and the Estradas and whatnot, but I'm sorry. There's no Ricardo Lopez, no Johnny Tapia, no Danny Romero, no Michael Carbajal, no Chiquita Gonzalez, and my personal favorite, Mark Two Sharp Johnson. Hell, there's not even a, there's not even a Yuri Abachikov. Hell, there's not even a Jerry Pinalosa at those eras of at those weight areas. So certainly, I wouldn't go all time is worse, but certainly it's pretty bad. It's not as great as people are making it out to be. No, I'm not. I'm not saying this is the weakest era. In the history of boxing, absolutely not. It is one of the weakest because simply, it, it listen when you have a bunch of interim champions, that kind of dilutes the talent pool. That's my issue. When you when you dilute the talent pool, you're gonna get champions that don't or 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 guys labeled champions that don't deserve to be champions. That's just my point, and I think that's why it makes it so bad. It's not necessarily the talent. I think the talent is good. It's really. I think it's pretty good. It's just the fact of the matter is you got guys that don't deserve belts walking around. You know, and that and, and they're probably not as good as some of the fighters of the past. And it kinda it kind of waters things down and it doesn't make the sport look as good. And I and and that's my my opinion on it. And and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit here and, you know criticize boxing. Because I think it's 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 doing pretty well, you know, as far as I mean certain things. But the t I think the town, I think the the interim titles really waters down, and that's where my my the issue of why I say it's weak because those 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 interim belts don't mean anything. They're just placeholders, and usually the number one contenders, which what they really are, are really not qualified to be in that spot. I'm sorry, Ken. I'm responding to some of the comments of, of Sweetbox and who's shooting back at us in the chat room. He's saying that um, um, I'll disregard what he talk about laughing off. Sometimes you got to just respond to stuff because it's just that ridiculous. Um, he's saying flyweight is stacked right now. No hell it ain't. I'm, no offense, I don't mean to go at you that way, uh, Sweetbox, but no way. No way. There's, there, there's not, it's the lack of depth. There is Ramon Gonzalez, there's Ioka. There is Estrada at 108, 112, that area. Maybe Heike Butler. Maybe. And that's about it. I'm sorry. Look, you don't, the lack of depth in those divisions. No count, you don't have the lack of depth. Like I said, the two Sharp Johnsons, the Tapias, the uh, Romeros, the Lopez, the Carvajal. Look, it's, I like Roman Gonzalez. I think he's one of the best pound for pound fighters in the world. I have him in my personal top ten. But what prior to Mark Two Sharp Johnson was around right now, he'd wipe the floor with him. So would Johnny Tapia. Yuri Arbachikov would be a prime Roman Gonzalez right now. That's just the truth as far as I'm concerned. So sure there are good fighters there, 
but the issue is where is the where is the depth where is the overall talent from top to bottom that's the issue here yeah I listen I, I know what I know what sweet box is trying to say I know what he's trying to say that I'm gonna be honest I think we we get a lot of we we you know I think the second tier of fighters when they all fight each other because that's usually what what you know what most of them do now anyway be, even though with their interim titles because most of them are B level fighters that had the interim titles anyway when we see B fighters fight B fighters I love that because they're both on the same skill level and they predict make good fights. But there's but there's not many on that elite level that should even be up on mixing in with that company. That's my issue. That is my issue. That's but other than that, I mean, I love when B fighters fight B B B level fighters. You know what? Because those are the best fights. At least the the competition is equal. That's just my that's just my personal opinion. Okay. Responding right quick to some more comments that's being made, but we've had our time to rant about that and sweet box and still comment in the chat room. But we can go back to that later after the show is over. Let's move on to one final news event because I can res clear res respond back because no schooling here. Let me just say that to a comment that's made in the chat room. No schooling here. I know too much. Kit knows too much. There's no schooling here. Please. Uh, let's move to one final news event before we go on to the upcoming bouts and then end the show. Um, a couple of months ago, Kent, I wrote a blog in which you read and followers of the blog read about uh, HBO's sour uh, attitude towards Guillermo Rigondeau. To give a backdrop, Guillermo Rigondeau had a unification fight with Donino Donaire, who was receiving all kinds of hype, and I would say it was somewhat justified. Back in April, well, Rigondeau, he boxed the pants off of Nonino Donaire. In the aftermath, there was a lot of uh, criticism thrown towards Guillermo Rigondeau's way, claiming that he was boring and he was this and that, not an exciting fighter. I thought the criticism was really unwarranted at a certain level, largely unwarranted, I should say. Well, there was a story that broke out which Bob Aaron had a meeting with HBO, and they mentioned Guillermo Rigondeau, and according to them, they mentioned he mentioned Rigondeau that HBO wanted to throw up, decided not to air any, not to do any business with Guillermo Rigondeau. I personally think it was because uh, HBO was hyping Nonino Donaire as their next superstar. Rigondeau upset the apple cart, and they were still upset over that. Well. A couple of weeks ago, news broke that HBO has had an about face. They've decided to air Ricky Dial's next bout, scheduled for December 7th or 14th on HBO, just at a site to be determined against, to be announced against the opponent to be determined. What's your opinion, Ken, on HBO's uh, 180 towards Guillermo Ricky Dial? At first, they decided they didn't want to do any business with him, and now, within the last couple of weeks, they decided that, hey, we like him now, at least temporarily, and decided to air his next bout in December. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually happy that they're at least going to broadcast this fight. Uh, I, I don't, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm just happy they're going to broadcast him. I, I don't know if the opinions of, you know, of rigging the eye will change. I doubt it, but I'm just glad he's going to be able to fight. And at least they, at least HBO is trying to work with him, and hopefully they can get him an opponent that will make him real more appealing to the to the fans that are on the on the uh, on the uh, border. Personally, I, I don't, I don't, I just, I think that's the problem mainly is the uh, the opponent. The opponent that they get for him, if it's not his fault that Donaire just didn't throw punches, it, it, Donaire just was basically fro like stuck in mud the entire fight, and you know Rigondeaux was able to um, fight at his own pace and and do what he needed to do. He wasn't challenged. Um, I think if they get him an opponent that will challenge him, which I think HBO will probably make an attempt to do. 
you'll 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 probably enjoy uh, rigging the out more. And I and I think that's basically it. I I hope I hope I hope the opinion changes somewhat, but I'm not expecting a huge opinion to change. The huge you know the 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 the, the, the opinion to change. I I don't think completely. But I I am I am glad HBO is working with him. And he's gonna be you know they'll we, they will broadcast the next fight. Um, any early words on uh, who the supporter might be? Uh, will it be a, the mandatory, which I think is well, no, it can't be quick. But any word? Have you heard anything in terms of who Rigging the Owl is going to be fighting next on HBO? No, no. I I, I would gather it'll be a mandatory. Or somebody on that mandatory, you know, plane. I, I just don't see it, it, it being a named fighter. Um, but I do expect him to like entertain possibly a fight with um, a couple of guys. But right now, it's I think it'll be mandatory if anything. Yeah. So let's move on to the talking about the upcoming fights this weekend. Um, headline, of course, by. Vladimir Klitschko uh, defending his IBF, WBO, WBA heavyweight belt in, on enemy territory in Moscow against Alexander Povetkin, 12-round bout. I look at this fight, and there's been some banter going on about does Povetkin have a chance. I'm sorry, Kent, unless Povetkin somehow catches Klitschko with a big punch. I just don't see it. I just think at some point that Klitschko, I'm just not impressed with Povetkin, to be perfectly honest with you. I was a little bit disturbed by how much he struggled against uh, Marco Huck, particularly the fact that Huck hurt him a couple of times in that bout badly. I just Huck think that at one point, right, and Huck being right now current cruiserweight champion, WBO version, I just think that at some point that Klitschko is going to catch him with a big punch and stop him. And there's a reason, ultimately, that, it's, uh, that uh, Teddy Atlas decided not to work with Pavek and because he sees what a lot of folk, what I basically say that he's not that good, that he's flawed. Yeah, I I don't see this being much of a fight, sadly, because I know a lot of people want a competitive Klitschko fight, you know, whether it be Vladimir or Vitaly. I don't expect Vitaly to fight after this, well, ever again, but that's just... Um, what I'm, what, what else I will say to is that Pavekin has a lot of things going against him. It's his size. Doesn't have a big punch. Um, I, I doubt he can get close enough to Klitschko to even land a decent shot. Um, I just, I just don't see where it's going to be anything competitive. It'll just be jab, jab, jab. I think it'll be like a Klitschko fight. Him using the jab to create distance and landing that sledgehammer sh punch to the right, and that's what you know. That's what he's going to do, and I think eventually he's going to hurt um, Pavekin and then take care of business and stop him. I, I don't see this being much of a fight, to be honest with you. I, I don't see anyone challenging Vladimir right now. Um, and it's kind of it kind of sucks because. If there was somebody there to challenge Vladimir, like there to challenge Vladimir or Vitaly, if he were to come back and fight, um, there'd be some good fights. But there's really no challenge for him out there. So he's gonna the the, the, the Vladimir train is gonna keep rolling. I, I say um, I say Vladimir will stop Pavekin inside of six rounds. Uh, also, this is uh, the Povetkin Klitschko bout as part of an HBO doubleheader. Um, the second part of the doubleheader is Miguel Cotto making his return to the ring following his uh, loss to Austin Trout last December, fighting Devin Rodriguez in Orlando, Florida. 12 round junior middleweight bout. Uh, aside from how do you think Cotto will do in this bout, what do you think, in, what improvements do you think Freddie Roach will add? to the game of Kodo, who in his fight against um, 
in his last fight, who looked to be, as far as I'm concerned, on the downside of his career. Yeah, I think he's on the downside, but I think this is a fight made to order for um, for um, Cotto. Um, Delvin Rodriguez is a pretty lanky guy. Doesn't have big power. Um, he's kind of a, a guy that o tries to overwhelm you with work rate. And I think Cotto is going to be really well conditioned for that fight. I think that's one of the things that that comes in when you well that's brought in when you when you you're in a Freddie Roach camp is conditioning because you notice like all of his fighters are pretty well conditioned. Um, and, and I th I think that's the one thing that'll be added. I, other than that, any new tricks? I, I doubt it. But I, for me, I think I think uh, Cotto should win a wide decision or a late stoppage against Delvin. I think I think it'll be a competitive fight for the first half, but then I think I think Cotto just starts wearing him down and you know taking care of business, especially late to the body. If Cotto struggles with Delvin, I would really consider for for Miguel to hang it up because this is an opponent he's supposed to look good against and. If he doesn't look good, I mean, I don't know what's the sense of keep going, you know, at this point, because he's had a good career. I mean, he is on the downside. I mean, I don't think he's shot by any mean. I just think he's past his prime. And if he slid down the mountain even more in his time off, I mean, there's no reason to keep going. But if he looks good and he, and he, and he does what he's supposed to do, which is win the fight rather easily, and and he 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 he'll be in the mix for 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 some sort of belt at 154, maybe a catchweight fight with Canelo. I, I don't know, but yeah, I, I ultimately think that Cotto will win because let's face it, Delvin Rodriguez he doesn't have the greatest chin in the world. He's more of a welterweight than he is a junior middleweight, and quite frankly, he's too hittable. I think Cotto is going to land shots on him pretty much most of the fight. So I think he will win. He'll possibly have a chance to stop him, and I don't. I don't think that Rodriguez take good shots to the body, and that's one of uh, Cotto's strengths. Uh, I said this was a double header on HBO. Actually, it's a triple header. I apologize for that. As on the undercard of Cotto and Rodriguez, pretty interesting fight. Terence Crawford, a rising lightweight, could be argued that he may be the best lightweight in the world right now. Uh, he's going to be fighting quite possibly the toughest fight of his career. Because Andre Klimov, a 10-round bout, we will talk about this before the show, and you have some interesting insight on Klimov. Uh, you think he's a very good opponent for Crawford Kent. Yeah, I think he's a good opponent to make Crawford look good because Klimov is the type of guy that comes forward and is hittable. Um, he showed that in, if, if anybody, um, it should be out there on YouTube, uh, his fight with uh, John Molina which was a fight where he showed that he's a, an aggressive pressure fighter that gets hit a lot. And I think this is the perfect opponent for Crawford because Crawford likes to use his, his boxing skill, his boxing ability, and, 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 tried to, and, if, and if you try to engage him into a, into a war, he'll find a way to land you know, his shots. And he, he's got very quick hands. So even if Klimov tries to pressure him, I think he's still gonna get, you know, even if he if he yeah. if, <laughs> if if uh oh, fuck <laughs> um if Crawford is gonna um if if Klima tries to engage Crawford in a war, which I expect him to, I think this is tailor made for Crawford because we know he has very good hand speed. And we and we saw the guy um, Sarabia try to engage him in a war, and look what happened, knocked him out. And I and I think that's where where Crawford's so good. He's got good hand speed. He has good power. He has good boxing IQ. I mean, he can box from the inside, you know, and 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 fight on the outside. So he has all the dimensions. Where where Klimov only has one dimension that's coming forward and pressing the fight. I I think this will. I don't think Crawford knocks him out. But I do think Crawford wins a comfortable decision and looks good doing so. 
But I will say this, Klimov will be there. He will be there. He'll be there in the fight. He may get, you know, you know, out fought and, and overwhelmed, but I think he'll be game and I think he'll be there the, the whole way. He's not gonna he's not gonna back off. Which which may like I was saying, which which is designed to make Crawford look good. Uh, interesting. Well, uh, 2012 London Olympic heavyweight uh, gold medalist Anthony Joshua is set to make his debut Saturday in London against a fighter by the name of Emmanuel uh, Leo. Six round bout in London. On the surface, this looks like a pretty tough bout for Joshua as Leo is undefeated. I believe eight wins. 8 and 0 with three knockouts, but in looking at his bout, and looking closer inspection of Leo's bout, uh, very suspect record. But with that being said, uh, I'm not mad at this debut for Joshua. Uh, he's supposed to fight a bout like this, even against a guy who's not as good necessarily as his record indicates. Your thoughts, thoughts on this bout, and your thoughts on the on Anthony Joshua and his uh, potential as a heavyweight. I think he has a good good future as a heavyweight. He's six foot six. He's he's a big guy. He's he's got power. You know, good boxing ability. But he's still raw. And I think this is a good fight for him. This is a really. I mean, this is a good fight for him in the sense of it's not the typical pro debut type of fight. Everybody in a pro debut, like most pro debuts, are supposed to get be against guys with losing records. But this guy's eight now. I give him credit for even though you can see on 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 the surface that you know even though the guy is eight no he's fought a lot of suspect guys but at the end of the day that's what you should be fighting as a pro debut especially if you're you're an Olympian and you want a medal that's what you should be doing you shouldn't be screwing around fighting guys one and eight you should be beat fighting guys like Leo, who have experience but aren't necessarily a threat. That's that's how you build a fighter. And I and I applaud, you know, the matchmakers there, um, matchroom sports for for making that fight. That's a good fight. That's that's the way you should build a, a, a prospect, especially an Olympian who's who's meddled and probably has fought tougher competition in in, in amateurs. Then, then, and then most most of them would fight in the early stages of their, of their pro career. So, I, I give him credit for making that fight. I, I think we all know that Josh will win. Yeah, but it's a good fight. It's a good fight. It's the way you should build a fighter. Don't build him with with, with cupcakes. You know, even though on the uh, we saw his record, it is a cupcake, but on paper it looks better. It sells better, if you get what I'm saying. Mm hmm. It sells better, and 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 for, and for and for people who aren't necessarily boxing fans, that go like hardcore boxing fans who are going to go to the fight and, and see see he's fighting an eight no. I mean, it's good for them because they'll say, oh, this guy, you know, he's fighting somebody with with experience. He must be good, <laughs> and he is good, but he's gonna he's gonna take some time to build him. He, he he's a raw guy, but he does have ability, and. You can see see he could have a future in the heavyweight division, but let's not let's not talk about that. Let's let him get through this fight first, and whatever fights he needs to get to the point where he needs to be. So time will tell how good it'll be. But I, I mean, this is a good fight as a as to kick off his career. So interesting about on the undercard of Joshua Joshua's debut as uh, you look at right quick. As Scott Quigg, who holds one of the WBA junior featherweight belts at 122, I don't even know what that means. He has a belt. Rigan Diaz has a belt. I mean, we all know Rigan Diaz is a champion, so why is Quigg have a I mean, You know how that goes with the WBA. He's going to be fighting uh, Yoandre Salinas uh, on the undercard of that belt. And uh, looking at Salinas' record, uh, not a bad guy. I think, uh, and I've, I've seen a couple of his bots on YouTube. Uh, Quick should win, but I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Salinas undefeated 20 and 0, 13 KOs. I wouldn't be surprised if he gives Quick a gut fight here. 
I think he's going to give Quig a good fight. I wouldn't be surprised if it was a very razor thin decision because most Cubans, you know, especially with the pedigree that most of these guys have, can fight. I'll be honest, I haven't seen a lot of Salinas, but I do know he can fight some, and I think he, he's, he's, he's a quick guy. And, you know, he doesn't have big power, but he, he knows how to box and, and he knows how to fight. And, and Quig is, is, has skill, and, and, and he's, he's bringing the same to the dance. So I think it's going to be a very close fight. I, I would favor Quig in a close, close decision, in a competitive fight. I, I, don't, I don't expect it to be a walkover. If it's a walkover, then simply Salinas wasn't as good as his record. But it seemed like he has a, a, a you know, he's a, is a good fighter. Um, he has a draw with a, a current um, interim title holder uh, uh, named Nerho Mar Cermeno. Cermeno, by the way, who gave um, for, uh, Al Samo Moreno two very good fights. The first fight, a lot of people thought he beat Cermeno. Uh, he beat uh, Al Samo Moreno. Yeah, and you can make an argument won both fights, but I think more so the first and the second. Um, also, um, he also has a very, a very close fight that he lost to Victor Terrazas, who just recently challenged Leo Santa Cruz. So this guy, Sermeno was a good opponent, and I, and 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 he got a draw against him. That may that may speak a little bit about how good Salinas is. I, I, it shows that Salinas is a good fighter, but he's probably not an, an elite fighter. Not yet, anyway. So I, I, I'd expect Quig to, to, to win a close decision. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're going to end the show on that note. Um, any last words before we close out, Ken? Enjoy the fights this weekend. Yeah, and I will agree with that. Um, enjoy the fights this weekend, especially... Uh, Nicolo Devlin Rodriguez fight. And watch for Terrence Crawford. Um, I think I pos I think he may be the best lightweight in the world, even though he doesn't have a belt. I like him a lot. Very good, uh, stylish southpaw. Who's more than just a cutie? Who's a guy who's tough as well? See how Miguel Cotto looks against Devlin Rodriguez. See how much he may have slipped or may not have slipped. Uh, wherever you get the chance to see Joshua, watch him. Uh, he has the potential to be uh, the next star in the heavyweight division. Uh, Klitschko Povetkin, I watch that just to watch Klitschko because I think he, I think he's going to destroy Povetkin. To be honest with you, uh, on the next episode of the Pound for Pound Boxing Report, uh, we will do a recap of these fights, and we will also uh, do a preview of Timothy Bradley's fight with Juan Manuel Marquez. Orlando Salido is going to be fighting on the undercard against Orlando Cruz for the vacant WBO belt. Vasil Lomachenko, hot, hot prospect, already talk, making his pro, technically professional debut. They already talk about him fighting for a world title in his uh, second bout against the winner of Salido and Cruz. We're going to be talking about that bout, all three of those bouts. And, and lastly, let me, let me say, I know we got some comments in terms of the, our response to our post-fight show, accusing us of being a little bit oversensitive. Look. Uh, for the large part, I did walk away from it, but I gave Kent some the platform where I co-signed a lot of what he said because, um, as I was saying earlier, some comments are fine. Even trolls are fine as far as I'm concerned. You know, dismiss them all. But some of those comments were got real personal and really unnecessary. I blocked a lot of them. But um, some things were said that just didn't need to be said, and I felt I needed to give Kent the platform to respond to that because of you can't go too far, even among trolls. You definitely can go too far. So, accusers of being oversensitive if you want, but sometimes some things it must be responded back because you can only say so much that just to the point of being real, not just ignorant but highly offensive. And I block because some of those comments just be just because of that. Yeah, I'm gonna be honest with you. I never say anything. I really don't give these people a time a time of day. But I just felt that some of the comments were too far. I mean, you, there's a line. I mean, you, you, so they were just rude. They were just rude. They were just coming on here simply to insult our intelligence and to just attack us for, for because we didn't see – we don't share the same opinion of Floyd as they do, and that's fine. But you know what? I'm cool with it. You know what? 
they're still watching the show great. I, I mean, you want to watch a show that's on the box, and you may learn something. I, I don't know, because most of them I just thought were Floyd fans anyway. So, um, but other than that, I'm I'm cool. You know, I I I, I and you know. I would just want to say, you know, the sweet box, and you know, I understand how you feel about today's era. I mean, where, you know, maybe you you value it a little bit more than we do. I, I don't think we're being dismissive. I just think we're being realist. But I I wish you didn't, you know, I wish you would, you know, you know, at least, you know, we could have debated about it. And obviously, you didn't, you didn't feel. Um, you know what? If if you know, we're sorry if the comments offended him. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. But yeah, yeah. Let me let, let me let me let me stop this right there. Uh, listen, um, I like Sweet Boxing. He's a good dude. Um, however, uh, there is there is no need for you to subsequently talk more trash, even after. I specifically go out of my way to say that if some of what we said offended you, then we apologize. Um, but normally, I don't go call folks out for that. I never be called out personally on Twitter and whatnot. But um, uh, let's just say you, 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 you're crossing the line right now, and I really don't appreciate it. Um, I go out of my way to invite you on the show and whatnot. Um, and then for you to say that, you're just really out of line. It's really rude and disrespectful. So uh, while I appreciate you joining us on the show, that'll be the last invite you will get from me. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not in the middle of it. I, I, I don't have anything to say bad to say about him. I well, he was saying stuff to us, both of us. Well, you know what? I'm not on Twitter, so... I, I know, but I know what you're saying. I mean, I don't think he, he needed to do all that, but, he, you know, I guess different strokes for different folks. I, I, I'm i sorry. I'm, you know what? I wish it wasn't, you know, like that. You know, you, you wish, I wish it didn't have to be like that, but hey. Yeah, well, you know what? Some people, I, I've learned that sometimes you can't, you know, you can't, they're going to have their opinion and they get, Kind of, you know, and they don't like it, and they want to say that stuff. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I have, I, I, I gave my opinion. I'm just not the type of person to get combative, really combative with people. I'm usually a mellow guy. I, I don't, I just try to talk boxing. Sometimes I, I get a little hot headed about it, but that's because I love to sport. But there was, I just didn't think there was any reason to get hot headed over that. But whatever. Um, sorry we had to end the show like that. Uh, no, you know, you know, I'm, I'll say to him again. If you sorry, you have to go. Have sorry, you have to feel that way. Again, if we say anything that you got under your skin or offended you, we apologize. But again, um, sometimes you just can't with people, and and and, and, I, and I refuse to deal with someone who goes out of their way and tries to call us out and demeans us in that in that way on the show. Um, look, we talk all things boxing. We should have called nothing, but um, at the same time, we should put up. We do not put up with folks who want to. Call us, call us out of our names and all that. That's just unnecessary. This is about having a civil dialogue, civil discourse about boxing. Um, and, and so, with that, with that note, we'll end the show right there. Again, uh, on the next episode, we'll do a recap of Klitschko and Povetkin, of the Cotto bout, the Terence Crawford bout, and we will do a preview of Marquez and Timothy Bradley and the bouts on the weekend of the fifth. Um, Sorry to end on such a bad note, but sometimes it, it is what it is. Um, right. Thank you, Kent, for being with me against, again this week. For my co-host, Kent, I'm your host, Michael. This has been another episode of the Powerful Pass Report. Despite what just transpired, you guys have a good evening. Good night, right. Kent. Right.